Well, thank you all very much for coming. This has been a fascinating set of talks, and I'm really glad that we're getting the skipper people and the soybean aphid people in the same room for the first time ever. This is really neat. Um, so as was mentioned, um, I've been working on biological control of soybean aphid, and um, I have two messages for you. The first message is that it could be worse, and I'll show you what I mean, and the second message is that it's getting even better, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. Um, first of all, it could be worse because predatory insects are already suppressing in many fields um, soybean aphid populations. And as um, Bob said, there are a lot of natural enemies. Um, they're not all necessarily native, but they're res resident. So living in our area, there are a lot of um, lady beetles. There are predatory flies, predatory bugs, predatory lace wings. These are all aphid predators. And they have all moved on to soybean aphid as a great new food source for them. And I'm going to tell you about an experiment that was done by a group of people. I was part of a large con consortium that did this, where we um, measured so soybean aphid predation in the field using um, a pred predator exclusion cage method. So what we did is, is that we compared the numbers of aphids on just plants, just open plants in the field, versus within these cages. And the point of these cages is simply to exclude predatory insects. And um, there are often problems when you do these sorts of studies, um, but we were careful to do them in such a way so that we can interpret the results um, to be due to a difference in predators, where they're present here and, and absent there. Um, and this was done, as I said, as part of a consortium um, of people in various states. So it was done over four states, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Mich Michigan. And the Minnesota sites were um, down at uh, Ro Ro Rosemont, Minnesota, and Lambert Lamberton and then in all these other sites, too. And uh, the typical kind of data that we'd get from these is we would look at aphid numbers after one week and after two, two, two weeks. And after that point, the experiment would be done. And, we count, and we'd count aphids um, in the open field area and, of course, in the cage. And what we typically find, not in all cases, but in most cases, is that you get um, higher aphids inside these cages, which, as I said, is due to predators being ex excluded from those. Now, I'd like to show you in this data set, this is the, the uh, spray threshold that Bob mentioned, which is, as he mentioned also, um, two, 250 aphids um, per plant. So this is basically an, an example of a data set showing that in the blue, in the open field, you don't reach the threshold. In the black, inside these cages where the predators are, are, are excluded, you exceed the threshold. So this is telling you that what the predators are doing is keeping the levels below the threshold, meaning that farmers really don't need a spray. Um, and so we, we looked at these data from all of our sites over the four states, and it was done over a couple of years. And we found um, that the fraction of the fields reaching the threshold was different in the presence of predators and without. And the status quo was, over these years, that um, about 15% of the fields reached the threshold level. So in theory, 15% of fields should have been treated during those years. In the absence of a predator, that would have risen to 80%. So if predators were not there, it would have been not 15, but 80. So in other words, without these predators, there would have been about five times as much spraying as there actually was. Does that make sense? 
Um, so that's what I mean by it could be worse. So these predators are doing us a great service. They're not doing a complete service because soybean aphid is still a pest. Um, I'm just saying that it could be worse. Um, the message, too, as I said, is that it's getting better. And uh, the reason it's getting better is because we have a new natural enemy in the system. And it's a parasitic wasp, a paras parasitoid called Aphelinus certus. And if it works, I have a little video showing the life cycle of this fascinating little insect. Let's see if it works. If it works, we're going to see the parasitoid. Yes. So this is a close-up of the little wasp. It's, it's about a mill millimeter long. And here she's coming up to an aphid. And what she's doing here is she's um, putting her ov ovipositor into the bottom of the aphid. And she's laying an egg. So she'll lay a single aphid, in, a, a single egg in that aphid. And, uh, and then. This is an, um, a, a stung aphid about five days after it's been stung. You can see the parasitoid larva inside is getting black. What we're looking at here is a dying aphid. You're, you're looking at a poor aphid dying. Now it's dead. And um, it's, it's going to turn black. And so this is what we call a mummy when they're black like this. And then you know, the adult wasp chews its way out. So that's the life cycle of these little parasitic wasps. And um, we have some native parasitic wasps that have this general life cycle, but they have not moved on to soybean aphid. Um, this species, Aphelinus certus, which I was going to mention, is not native here. So it's native to Asia, and it came in on its own. So this is not a biological control agent that we brought over and re released. This is one that came on its own. And um, it was first re recorded in North, North America in 2005 in Pennsylvania. And since then, it's been found in all of these states. So you know, if, you, if you remember back to Bob's map, um, this little wasp has now spread out um, basically throughout the soybean growing area. But you know, it hasn't been that long, so it's not necessarily very high levels in all of those states. Um, we documented it in Minnesota for the first time in the summer of 2011. And we've been finding it every year since. And the numbers per field are rising every year. And these are some data that we got in co collaboration with um, the Minnesota Department of Ag, where their scouts, um, the, the um, MDA scouts, went to all of these sites that the, where the dots are. And they sent us those samples. And then we looked at them to see whether there was aphelinus certus in those samples. And all of the blue counties were ones that had aphelinus certus. So you can see that as of these years, 2014 and 15, um, they were widespread throughout the state. Um, it looks here like maybe not in southeastern Minnesota, but from our sampling from 2016, Jonathan Dragney, who's in the room, did that work. Uh, we found that they're there now, too. So this new little parasitic wasp is now widespread throughout the state of Minnesota. But can it control soybean aphid? Or is it just there and not doing much? So I'm going to tell you about an experiment that a former graduate student, Joe Kayser, did. And you probably recognize this field. Do you know where we are here? Maybe some of you were walking or driving by in 2015 and saw these cages up, and you thought it was some kind of like a modern art project or something, but it's actually an experiment. And, and I'm going to tell you what Joe did. Um, he set up another cage study. This is a little more complicated than the previous cage study that I mentioned. Um, he had five treatments. One was a total exclusion, which had a fine mesh screen so that it would, ex would exclude 
all natural enemies, including the parasitic wasp and also predatory insects. Um, he had one that was just open field. And then he had a predator exclusion. So this had a, bro a wider mesh. So you, know, you saw that the parasitic wasps are tiny. So it's po and, and the predatory insects are much bigger. So it's possible to use a screen that lets in the parasitoids, but keeps the predators out. We can't do it the other way, unfortunately. But uh, we can do that way. And then you had these um, predator controls and total controls, which were basically the same as these other treatments, only with holes cut in them so that we're um, not changing the microclimate as we're putting on the cage. It's just sort of a con control. And um, these are the results. Th these are the main r results of his study. What we saw was that soybean aphids reached high levels only in the total exclusion. So in all of these other treatments, which were open, um, um, in this case, um, to everything, and in this case, only to uh, parasitic wasps, they were low, and in the con controls, too. And, um, and I'll note, you know, I'll do as we always do, put up our thresh threshold line. So what this is basically saying is that these treatments were able to keep the soybean aphid densities below the economic threshold level meaning that, in the presence of these, um, a grower should not have to spray. And the other thing that I'd like to say is this predator exclusion cage is the one where only the parasitoids are allowed to access the plants. This is showing, in other words, that the parasitoids on their own are able to control soybean aphids below the levels necessary to spray. Um, so I was really excited when I saw these data. And, and I'd like to say, too, that um, I've been working on this system since 2001. And you know that was a year that I went to China for the first time to look for parasitoids of soybean aphid to introduce. And so I've been waiting for a graph like this for 15 years. <laughs> And I finally got it. Um, it. It wasn't the way that I expected or hoped, because this is actually from a parasitoid that came in on its own. It was not one of those that I found in China and brought back to the quarantine lab and did all sorts of studies on. It was one that came on its own. OK. Um, and I'd also like to show you what the parasitism rates were were inside those cages. And first of all, just to let you know, 99% of the parasitoids in those cages were Aphelinus certus. So there are some other paras parasitoids, but really all we had in this study pretty much were these. These are, of course, naturally occurring. There were no re releases of any, any, anything. So what we see here first is that even in the total exclusion, some Aphelinus got in. So this is a total exclusion cage, sorry, this is, this is showing the parasitism rate, so the fraction of the aphids that were stung. And we see that even in the total exclusion, where we should have none, that's the point of the exclusion, to exclude them, we still got almost 5%. This is typical, actually, aphelinus certus we found in our lab is capable of getting into almost any cage and uh, con contaminating almost any cage. So they did it here too, but you know you can still see that there were far more. And you know if anything, this just makes our result cons conser conservative. But what we can see though, it's kind of nice, is that um, the level of parasitism, in the, you know at the other sites uh, where the parasitoids were allowed entrance was about 15 per percent. So we showed that really only 15 percent of parasitism is needed. Um, to um, su suppress soy soybean aphids um, at the levels that we saw. So uh, the conclusions from the cage study were just what I said, that aphelinus can suppress soybean aphid populations 
Um, it can even ma maintain them uh, below the 250 aphid economic threshold. And that parasitoids alone were, in this case, as effective as predators by themselves, uh, um, or both of them to together. OK, um, I think that's pretty exciting. But what does it mean for conserving skippers? Um, basically, the way that I look, look at this, and of course, this is what we're here for, is um, it, it is that aphelinosaurus could pr protect skippers if basically all of these are true. And the first is that it suppresses soybean aphid populations near skipper habitat. This was one study done during one year, 100 yards from where we're standing now. So, and the skippers are present, as you know, well, as, as we've learned, there's hardly any in Minnesota at all. But if anywhere, it's in far western Minnesota in the prairie regions. So we need to know whether what, we, what Joe Kayser saw here during one summer happens near those sites and happens consistently. So you know, we need to do multiple year studies in those areas, is, is what I would say. Um, the second, and as a questioner brought up, um, it only works if most soybean growers use the threshold of 200 aphids per plant. So the growers have to use a threshold for this to work. This whole analysis is based on the idea that the soybean growers are using the threshold. If they don't use it, if they spray prophylactically, or if they spray as soon as they see any aphids, then you need to lower them much, much farther. And the third one is that they would only pr protect skippers if the drift that we're talking about is really causing the skipper de declines, which is also a question that we need to grapple with. So basically, the way that I look at it, at it is with these three conditions, we sort of set our research, uh, research agenda. So we need to find whether um, aphelinus can su suppress soybean aphids in those areas, and also whether the drift is the cause of the decline. Th those are the main research questions. And this middle one about whether or not growers use the threshold that's sort of the outreach agenda. That's, that's, that's what we need. You know, that's sort of the edu education piece, I think, that we need to get out there. And, and I would like to say that um, Bob and his colleagues do a great job of going out into these areas, talking to farmers at various meetings, one-on-one -on -one in various ways. They're getting this message out. Um, but still, this is, this is what we need um, to work on. And I think with that, I'm finished. And I'd like to thank the people who helped with um, the research, which is Joe Kayser, Jeremy Cohn, another previous grad student, and the group that did that multi-state study. And of course, the MIT PPC, the IONE, some of my funding, the MDA who helped with that study. So thank you very much. I hope I have time for questions. Definitely specific to aphids. And what about to this particular aphid species? But it's not specific to soybean aphid. So, um, you know, I mentioned briefly that I had gone to China with others to look for specialized parasitoids to bring here and to re release. And we got permits for three species that were highly specialized on soybean aphids in that little clade. Um, this was not one of those. This was one that we tested in the lab and said, this is too much of a generalist. We don't want to bring it in. <laughs> so it's a generalist within not even all of the aphids, but within the subfamily aphidine, which is the biggest subfamily of the aphids. Um, so we do expect 
that it's going to attack native aphids, and including prairie, native aphids in prairies. So there's going to be that trade-off. It might be saving the skippers, but it might also be endangering native aphids. Thinking about the declines in some of these prairie butterfly populations that we've seen across the states, across the states, so they're they're only resident in these few localities. So in your list of three, you said if it's in proximity to the skipper, mm -hmm. but do you think the scope? It strikes me that the question, one question is conservation of remaining extant populations, but another key question is restoration potential for reestablishing populations where they oh, went previously okay. extinct. Yeah. So the That's question the geography to which your to which mm -hmm. this applies could be much larger if there's if there is active consideration about reintroduction okay. and restoration work. I hadn't even thought of that yet, so that's a really good point. Thanks for bringing that up. It would be an interesting analysis to actually see what what is the potential geography or footprint of this Right. in that historic range. I don't know if you thought about that from a sort of GIS type of yeah, yeah, yeah. scoping project. I'm curious about the density of, of predators or parasites that are necessary to, to suppress the aphid population. And how long would it take a field after it's been sprayed to, to build those levels of predators back up to a sufficient level? I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, um, the natural enemies do tend to congregate towards where there are more aphids, so they tend to do that, especially the lady beetles. Um, but the question about when you spray a field and you get rid of the aphids and then the aphids recolonize, are the predators able to get back in there. I, I don't think that question has been answered yet. I'm going to look at Bob in case he knows. But. I don't think so, but one kind of promising angle is that there are some insecticide chemistries that are more selective, so not the broad spectrum, that they kill everything. Um, so the one thing we're kind of looking for is something that's selective or killed off the aphids, but they leave some of those natural enemies in there. And then you get that colonization event, they don't kill off all the aphids. And then you have some natural suppression. Yes, sir. Is, is there um, any concern about the general ag environment and its effect on the populations of these natural enemies? I mean, is, are there practices that, that current production agriculture could use to enhance that pressure from the natural enemies, apart from yeah. the actual treatment of their crops, right, right, but, right. but in the wider landscape? Yeah. So actually, that study that I showed that had you know, the exclusion cages versus the open that was done over the four states, um, the main point of that was to answer that exact question. What's the role of the landscape in, um, in um, affecting biological control of soybean aphid? And we did find in that study that the more diverse landscapes had stronger and more effective biological control of soybean aphid. Yes, we did find that. And it was mainly in the form of um, the more woodlots you have, the higher the chance of biological, or, or the stronger the biological con control. So those trends are there, but they're trends. And I would, I would never tell a farmer, oh, this field is fine. It's got like three woodlots you know, all around it. Or if you plant uh, you know, a certain uh, set of plants that you'll be fine. So the, these trends do exist, and it's true that more d diverse landscapes support better bio, bio, bio control of soybean aphid, but it's not at the level where you would be able to pr predict a certain level of con control. I, re I remember reading that in parts of Europe anyway that they deliberately in Operate into their field management habitat yeah. for natural enemies. Do we like do beetle, anything like that in this country? 
Uh, well, maybe you're thinking of beetle, beetle banks. Yeah. Yep. Beetle banks have been tried, and other methods like that have been tried here, more sort of ex experimentally, and also flowering strips. A and I do know of some cases where those things have worked, mainly in California. I happen to know some cases. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's not a widespread practice, and it's also not something where I'd feel comfortable going to a grower and saying, just plant a flower strip here, you know, you won't have any pests, or you know, install a beetle, beetle bank. Um, it might increase your chance of getting stronger biological control, but not that much. Maybe buffer strips, that's the gist of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we All have right, some of that. Yeah.